So we'll, uh, we'll open it up to questions. I've got about five pages worth. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, uh, so I'll start out on my, on my first page. This is uh, for, for Jeff. Um, uh, is there any data, Jeff, that you're aware of to assess the spread in ASP? Meaning uh, it's clear that a small practice isn't able to really get drugs for the same price as a large academic cancer hospital or a, uh, or a national practice like U.S. Oncology. Do we know how wide that spread is? Well, I think we know there's a spread. I'm not aware of the data that you'd, you'd look I, to, to. I know when I joined U.S. Oncology in 95 that, that, that our drug prices dropped about 10%. I know that over time after ASP that narrowed to where it was much narrower than that. But uh, I've never seen the spread either. I think it would be valuable information as people try and figure out what to do about drug prices to get a greater understanding of what it really means to the small practices. Um, so we do know from work by Richard Frank, who's an economist at Harvard and now um, Assistant Secretary of Planning and Evaluation, that um, the ability to um, aggregate demand for very significant volume does produce very significant savings on the acquisition costs. And I don't see why that would be any different in the infusion setting relative to the retail um, oral drug setting. I mean, certainly, certainly the, the importance of that is that when you're dealing with a small margin, um, uh, as you are with drugs, uh, it, it very quickly, when you're dealing with ASP plus 4.3, 4. Uh, becomes an imperative to send patients to the hospital because you can no longer assume the risk of the drugs by buying and billing them. Questions? Lee, I um, really enjoyed your slide comparing Zelox to Folfox, which is basically comparing pill to infusion. Um, and you asked, with those tremendous difference in costs, why would anybody give the pill? So I'm going to take the bait. Um, you know, the, the reason why I use that regimen, and as a GI oncologist, that's a decision that I make in clinic every day. Do I go with Solota or do I go with, with the 5-FU? There's a lot of nuance in, in side effects and all of that, but really it comes down to convenience. It comes down to whether or not patients have to wear a pump. It comes down to how often patients have to come in to clinic. And, you know, you, you ask the question of, is that worth it to society? Because most of the time, patients aren't seeing uh, most of that bill. But I, I'd really like to hear the, the answer to that question is, do you think it's worth it to society? We've got ethicists and insurers and economists on the panel. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. I'll put that a little bit further into context. I wrote this down. For those who aren't familiar, 12 weeks of Folfox means 12 visits to the doctor. Six of them will be three to four hour long visits, and six of them will be 15 minutes. You'll wear a pump uh, for every other week for 48 hours infusing chemotherapy. Zelox 12 weeks is four visits to your doctor, one and a half hours per visit. There may be a lot of opportunity cost between those two regimens that's not reflected in the drug costs. I'm really glad you brought that up because that is that that was not in the slide and very much a, a factor. But it it does raise the unanswered question: Is could I take that twenty thousand dollars and uh, pump that into uh, pertuzumab, which really makes a difference for that breast cancer patient, and she's got a hundred eighty-four thousand dollar treatment around that I got to pay for. So it's. Uh, the, the former director of NICE put it very beautifully. He, he told me, well, every time we approve one of these drugs or we get pressured to do that, I have to walk over to the dialysis patients and say, well, we're going to shorten the qualifying age for dialysis by six months in order to pay for these cancer drugs. And, and so that's the bigger question we're trying to address. Now, you don't get that at the individual patient-physician interchange. I get that completely. But it's the question as policy we're going to have to decide. Do we inconvenience that patient? Um, and I don't think it's a minor inconvenience in order to have enough money to pay for other therapies which may have more benefit is uh, down the line for other cancer patients. I don't know the answer, but uh, we had a great way of illustrating it with uh, your patient in those, that exhibit. Here. Here, if I can, f oh, Jeff, please. I, I was just going to say, you know, we, we use a lot of capecitabine in breast cancer, and so I, I'm sympathetic to the physician side of this. but. But 20, roughly $25,000 for convenience when, you know, median household income is something like 
40,000 is just is too high. We, we, I think we can all answer that question. And the question, though, is to innovation is not just about improving survival. It is about convenience. We want people to develop drugs that are, you know, that you don't have to go to the doctor's office, that you, you're not having nausea and vomiting, low blood counts, infections, et cetera. So I think we, we need some sanity in terms of where the yield is. And we know that if the patients, we don't, I agree with what Dr. Zafar said earlier, we don't, any of us think that patients should be making that decision in the clinic. Um, but we also know that that price of innovation, $24,000 for the convenience between a pump and a pill, just wouldn't exist. You couldn't price the drugs that way um, if, if the patient saw the cost. It, it, uh, I'd like to follow up on that, and thanks for that comment. Uh, the, uh, the, I mean, there's a bunch of issues nested in there, right? This argument that people regularly make that healthcare is actually viewed as a luxury good by our society. Then this issue about the convenience makes sense. But all I can think about is 20 grand for admittedly inconvenient and unpleasant trips to the doctor, multiple trips such as that. But I live in New York City, in Brooklyn, and there's alternate side parking on the street, which means that one day a week people have to sit in their cars bef right before 8 a.m. 8 a.m. and then again about 5 p.m. so they can have the car on the other side so they can street move the street, clean the street, and then move the car again. The local parking garage charges $12 to park in the garage for that day. Yet people sit in their cars for that hour in the morning for the alternate side. So I think they're signaling a lot about how much they think value the convenience or inconvenience of that hour of their time. In fact, they're pricing it exactly for us. So it's very difficult for me to look at the person sitting in the car Wednesday morning in front of my front door and then ask this question about, oh, but $20,000 is worth a few trips to the doctor. That may be true for very, very few people. Um, the question I actually had is a different one. If we went to a bundle, I've been proposing for a while that we bundle drugs. And there's been quite a bit of market resistance, let's just say. Medical oncologists think it's a shitty idea. So, but the question is, if you move to that, if you handed the money to treat this patient to the doctor, and they had the option of buying the pill or using the 5-FU, and they had to pay in either case, would we see the same practice pattern? Mostly the pill for $20,000 more. Or comments on anything, Lee? I think that sounds like a pilot worth doing, he said, uh, suspiciously. Um, <laughs> please stay but tuned. You didn't include it in your pilot, right? Yeah. So, which you weren't going to talk about <laughs> today. Please so. stay tuned in a month because we will be published on our episode payment. And uh, it did change some behaviors in ways that we did not expect. And that's about all I can say right now. Um, so, but I think you raise a great question. And if you took that just a little bit further and said to the patient, here's your budget, patient for your care, what would you like to do with that money? Um, there may not be any doctor visits. So, you know, Peter, I, we've discussed this at length. I think the problem with it is the issue of taking a fairly stark example and believing you can generalize it. And, um, and so um, I, I think the risk, g given the current construct, the risk of, um, of shortchanging the patient and, and specifically not adopting really meaningful uh, innovation is is a very real risk. I, so I'm, uh, I'm, I have a little bit of problem with it. It's not that I'm opposed to episode-based reimbursements, the issue of whether the drugs in or drugs out, and I think that's the that's the real question. I, 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 my only comment would be that I think that uh, incentivizing people to use too much drug is a bad idea. Incentivizing people to use no drug is a bad idea too. And, and uh, uh, you know, uh, we, I think that eventually, if we were lucky enough to get to where you could take all incentive to the phys of cost to the physician out of the equation, uh, that would be the best circumstance, but it would be milk toast to the two sides of the spectrum that, that really want to change the incentives one way or the other. I, Listen, um, I'm, hi. Oh. <laughs> well, I've, just a quick point on that. You know, again, stepping outside of the cancer space, um, dialysis just bundled a couple of years ago, and it's really fascinating to see what's going on over there. Uh, they moved all of the drugs, EPO, EPO and all the other kind of originally IV uh, administered drugs that the, the facilities were getting paid for separately. Uh, they moved it all under a single bundled payment. We've seen utilization come down of all three drugs by anywhere between 10 and 30%. Um, and now what Medicare did to try to encourage the other side of that, they put in quality measures. They said, we're going to watch, we're going to make sure patients' uh, hemoglobin levels don't drop too low. We're going to watch and make sure some of the other adverse events aren't happening and put quality incentive payments on that side of it. 
Um, but it is a really fascinating case study to watch. And again, I agree that you can't generalize. But as we look at what providers, how they respond to a change in their, in their incentives, uh, we've, we've got a great case study going on right now. Um, I, so I'd like I to, oh, I'm sorry, I'd like to add something um, to that, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> um, which is the following. Um, I, 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 I mean, I am a very strong proponent of rationing on the um, supply side here, not to make physicians or patients um, pay um, directly for the cost of um, potential overuse or misuse. But I do really worry about generalizing from the EPO example in the cancer space, and that's because, Frank, let's just be honest, we don't have great quality metrics for much of outcomes related to cancer care. And therefore, what we're stuck with are process measures, which may or may not be correlated with outcomes in any way. And so the opportunity for gaming and also for stinting kind of looms its head in those cases, and I would just, I would just um, uh, caution, be cautious. I'm not as good at Barry at knowing everybody's name and where they came from, so if you can introduce yourself before you ask your questions, that will be helpful for uh, IOM. Hi, I'm Gwen Derry in Cancer Support Community. So I've got a question for clarification, and maybe it's implicit to everybody here, but when you're talking about, when we've been talking about adherence, and when I was listening to Lee Newcomer, you're talking about patient barriers to adherence primarily around cost. It doesn't feel to me, and, and there are so many other factors that go into the barriers to adherence, um, whether it is, if you're a CML patient and have to take drugs for the rest of your lives, and I think of that, and I think of some of the conversations in that community that, that mirror the ones in the HIV community about drug holidays. If it's oral chemotherapy, that there's an inconvenience of a fixed period, inconvenience, quote unquote, of a vic fixed period of time between oral and infusion. If, I mean, so there's so many different parts of it that it, it what I heard, and maybe I, that was just what I was hearing on this panel, was that it was much more about cost and inconvenience as opposed to the very multifaceted reasons why people may not, why, why there are barriers to adherence. Absolutely true. So as, as a physician, you know, there's, with, with the aromatase inhibitors, for example, symptoms are a major role. Um, and there's many factors. But what people have tried to do is to isolate the effect of cost by saying all things being equal, you have a higher copay or lower copay, does that impact it? So that should control for all of those other things. Nobody's denying those may be 10 times more important. But you still see in some studies a difference based on cost. Um, and they, the symptoms and other issues should be the same. For other than lowering the cost of drugs or making them free, what else might we do that would improve co that, those compliance numbers? We know from our study that uh, having a uh, set at least three sessions a month with a specialty pharmacist improved compliance. And that's why I started with side effects. I mean, there are dozens of reasons why people won't take those pills other than just cost alone. Yeah, and, and I, just to be clear, I, I wanted to make it crystal clear that my comments are specifically that it's a lot more complicated, right? So what we have is an opportunity to do a little natural experiment. That's that's my plea. Is it worth doing the natural experiment or not? Because we may be able to remove a variable, a variable. Now, I must say that the breast cancer data gives me pause. Having taken care of a lot of breast cancer patients, I would agree compliance is a toxicity issue in that population, plus a, a, the treatment fatigue, which you've commented on, I think is true. Uh, although the study that I showed actually looked at early use, not prolonged use. Hi, <clears throat> Brian Rosen with uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Um, so I was surprised a little bit with uh, um, Dr. Newcomer when you talked about um, the oral parity and uh, the lack of data showing either superiority or inferiority on the orals. I wonder if you can expand a little bit about that, because um, in the oral parity legislation that a number of us have been advocating around the country, in, um, the common thought, I guess, is that there are advantages generally to um, the oral administration, and that a lot of these pills do have significant advantages clinically. And just wondering if there's any more data than, than the, the, I know you showed a few, a couple of, of examples. I wonder if you had any more information. The other thing I just want to say real quickly is, Dr. Colage, um, you know, the, the, the $6,350 out of pocket, it actually can get a lot higher even when, um, you know, we're only talking about access to drugs. But when you start talking about access to, um, 
networks and your specialty providers. If they're not in your network and you got to go out and network for your care, then uh, there are a lot of folks who think that your out-of-pocket costs can actually be much higher than 6,350. Just, just food for thought. I know it's not part of the drug equation, but wanted to add that anyway. So, Brian, I think I was very clear. Question number one is what's the diagnosis? And so if you have CML, there is no debate about orals being better. But as a, as a general class, oral versus intravenous, I can't say that one approach is superior to another at all. It all depends on what's the specific diagnosis in the case of point about that patient. I don't think there's any more to say. And, and I will agree with you, this is not, so we weren't tasked with discovering, discussing network um, construction or development or the impact of the ACA. Um, actually, I think NCCN has got a policy forum coming up about that. But um, the truth of the matter is that uh, you're right, out-of-pocket uh, uh, related to out-of-network uh, expense does not count against yeah. your deductible. Just as your current insurance does not allow it to count against your deductible, that's the way it has been yeah. for a long time. Um, now, what you may have issues with is how our networks are constructed, and I'll be honest with you, uh, we're, we're actually working, still working on that, I think. I don't think we got that one figured out by a long shot. Dr. Ramsey? Hi, yeah, Scott Ramsey from uh, Seattle Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center. So this is a, gets back to this adherence out-of-pocket issue, and I, and I think the uh, uh, full Fox versus Zellox example is great in that, you know, once less convenient and it's a lot less expensive, one's more convenient, theoretically, but uh, a lot more expensive. But Lee, at the same time, you showed you know, terrible adherence numbers. So if you as an oncologist were choosing between the all oral and infusion drug, and you knew that 40% of your patients, for example, who you put on the all oral, would stop before completing treatment, that makes the value much worse. So again, it makes me wonder what's going on with the prescribing here when we're comparing orals and infusion drugs. Now, maybe adherence to infusion isn't 100%. It certainly, certainly isn't. But I wonder if it's a lot better because those patients know they got to come to the doctor to get unhooked or to get, you know, and there's a social aspect. Um, so I, I'm not sure. I guess, it's more of a comment, I guess. I'm just not sure that this argument about convenience washes if we're looking at that in terms of efficacy. And that's the point of the provide paper as well, is that um, we've got so much noncompliance that those patients may in fact not respond to their tumor because they can't get the drug in, and it's a very real consideration. Is, is it possible that if, uh, with, with IV therapy, the doctor knows whether the patient got it or not? If I had uh, a, a nurse triage system that called the patients uh, every other day, make sure they were taking their meds, if the meds were delivered to my door instead of to their door, and I gave them their, their meds a week at a time as they came in for their blood counts or whatever, and I counted their pills for them, would that improve compliance? And how much would it be worth to improve that compliance? Because now you're back to... Uh, uh, I, I need a, a fee to be able to provide that kind of service that I'm not being paid now. I don't know whether it'd be worth 6% of the cost of that oral drug or not. Just to further expand on our, our specialty pharmacy program that was measured, we, we spent about 30, months a, or 30 minutes a month with a patient using a pharmacist, and that improved compliance 6% overall. So, yeah, um, I think... You know, the kind of time you're talking about is very expensive and very real, and I'm not sure it would get us a huge leap in benefit. Hi, Kevin Olson from uh, Portland Providence Health System. Um, have a, 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 I want to share a concern, actually, uh, about the uh, unintended consequences of our shift to orals, uh, assume, assuming even for the moment that they would be cost-neutral with IVs. Uh, I think when you look in our infusion suites, and you look at the angels we call our infusion nurses, they are doing a lot more than delivering drugs. And I know in Portland where we've engineered embedded palliative care, where we're um, having social workers uh, uh, get to those patients. It, this is the place where the nurse uh, can act as a case manager. She can tell us if the husband is a player. She can tell us if there's stress that's not being picked up on in the exam room. She can make sure that the prognosis uh, the patient understands is consistent with what's in the chart. And, and that goes away if you're in, in an oral uh, uh, a 
arena. I look at the day when CLL, I wonder if CLL will quickly become a disease where they never see an infusion suite. And so I worry about the days when those patients uh, are, are not in our clinics in that way, um, or, or even worse, that we have a group of patients who are in the clinics getting infusions and getting these extra services, and we have another set of patients that are out not getting those services, and we're trying to engineer two different um, of delivery platforms to handle that. So I don't know if that's something that's come up in your radar or a concern. And, and Jeff, I was going to ask if you think that the payment scheme that's been proposed by ASCO would address some of that uh, concern. Um, the payment scheme uh, uh, that we've proposed, that ASCO has proposed, is um, uh, in, makes the payment for management of the patient the same whether they're on oral drugs or IV drugs, except that we have not been able to tackle uh, yet the buy and bill proposition. Um, our goal would be eventually to be able to change uh, buy and bill in a way that makes sense and then to fold a management fee into the monthly bundled payments and that patients on oral drugs would be treated the same way that patients on IV drugs are. Um, that, that does bring me to a, a question that, that I had a little bit uh, about for, um, uh, for Jeff and for anybody else. You mentioned a chemo administration fee. Uh, as one possibility for uh, replacing buy and bill, something we've spent a lot of time looking at. As a physician, it's, it has seemed like my job is at least in part to be a good shopper. I may be buying filet mignon, but I'm supposed to buy the cheapest filet mignon I can find. Um, and uh, I also assume a lot of risk associated with uh, buying that. Once the manufacturer sells it to the GPO for 48 hours and the GPO sells it to me, all the risk is mine. If I spill it, uh, if the patient doesn't show up, if the patient's too sick to get it, if, uh, the, if Lee decides not to pay for it, uh, if the RAC decides that it was a second-line drug and I, was only supposed, and I used it first line, um, those are all my risks. Um, is a, uh, when you switch to a management fee, all of that risk goes away. Uh, who's going to assume that risk? Who's going to be responsible for being the good shopper and assuming those kind of risks in that kind of system? Yeah, I, th I, th I think I, when I was speaking, not on the slide, I qualified that saying this is not going to cover the, the float and, and some of the issues. That's only one of the issues you're getting to, but the fact that you have to have, a, you know, as you said, a million dollars of inventory. I just think the more you can um, uncouple, pay, pay for what we're, what we're trying to do, the fact that we were trying to cover and practices covered a huge range of what they, you know, from the nutrition services and the patient support programs, et cetera, all with this money that was, that was narrowly attached to which drug you give is, is, you have to say, is partially responsible for creating the massive distortions we faced. And I think we've overcorrected, but to begin uncoupling them and then look at the problems, as you say, of, you know, who's going to be responsible for inventory? There's going to be some risk. You can't it, access, sometimes patients come in, they've progressed that day, they, they may be having a pain crisis. They may need treatment that day. You, you can't wait a month uh, in cancer care to adjust your supply to the demand. So I think you need a system that, that um, considers that. But some of the stuff that was built into the buy and bill model has to go, I think. Um, Patty Gans, UCLA. Um, I just wanted to comment on the comparison of uh, capecitabine and uh, 5-FU by infusion. Uh, there was a trial, RO4, which was a rectal cancer trial that compared uh, capecitabine or 5-FU by infusion uh, with, with or without uh, 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 oxaliplatin. I did the quality of life uh, assessment for that. There was essentially no difference in quality of life, but we had a convenience of care question in there. There's no difference also in the outcomes. It was just reported at ASCO, so equivalency, but in terms of convenience of care, patients reported substantial benefits in terms of convenience of care. So that's one point. The second point is, you know, the downstream and other costs, the ability to go to work, uh, care for one's family, the cost to the purchaser of the insurance, i.e. those self-insured plans. So those things are things that we need to account for. And Lee, you know, you talked about the savings in terms of other hospitalizations and other things because of the specialty pharmacy. That's great, but what are we going to do about the Medicare population, really, who are the majority of people who are getting these drugs for which there are no kind of special handling of all these things unless we, in fact, make the physician and broadly writ their office responsible for doing 
the education about the oral drugs, if that's the only drug that's available for their treatment or for the toxicities and management of their infusional therapy, whatever it is, because it's the downstream costs of uh, unexpected hospitalizations, dehydration, et cetera, that may come with these treatments that really lead to the increased cost of care. I think, you know, we're all focusing, again, this goes back to the talk of Alex about, you know, cost of drugs are what we're most sensitive to because we go to the pharmacy and we have to pull out a credit card or, you know, pay with cash for that. But truly, it's the total cost of care. And if we do not handle the management of these patients who are getting very toxic drugs, neurotherapeutic toxic ratio with the high touch that's needed, that increases the cost. So I think, you know, just again, focusing on the drug itself and how we manage the delivery and prescription of the drug is a limitation of this discussion. So, any response? So, Patty, you've asked me to fix Medicare, and yes. yet, <laughs> uh, where do you go? Because our, uh, <laughs> I think you may have appropriately laughed, but I can't. Yeah. I, but, I, but I do want to underscore your point. I, I, at least in our world, um, it's now 75 percent. I heard somebody say up to th um, 65 percent of all of the costs are not drugs in cancer. And so paying attention to the tests that we order and the side effects we create and the, and the symptoms the patients have, dealing with those early and keeping people out of the hospital is to me the far greater way of saving money for cancer care mm -hmm. and the patient's going to benefit. Yeah. Uh, it means that we dealt with issues quicker, faster, more appropriately and they suffer less. And in, as far as adherence, most of the data has shown at least in breast cancer, if the patient has a physician or a nurse to talk to and help them manage their side effects, they're more likely to stay on that therapy. Brian Drucker, when I was giving a talk at Oregon Health Sciences, told me that fatigue is one of the biggest side effects of the matinib, and that is one of the biggest problems he deals with in his clinic, and keeping patients on that life-saving therapy means addressing that symptom. So I think, again, calling for a comprehensive solution to drug management and adherence and picking the drug strategy, if you will, that's best for the patient who's right in front of you. Because for some, it's going to be an IV drug. For some, it's going to be an oral drug. But you need a management plan, a treatment plan for that patient that is in sync with where they are in their lives. And I think that's what we need to pay for, and it'll probably save money in the end. I think on the convenient issue, I, I, I noticed, Eric, that you, uh, uh, you had the data that showed that uh, older patients stayed, were in um, offices more. I don't know with the trend toward, from offices to hospital outpatient department is going to necessarily change where physicians are practicing uh, at this point in time, but I know that those of us that have practiced in the community for a long time have always known that our older patients stayed closer to home, which often meant being treated in the community, and, our, and that younger patients, whatever was influencing them, whether it was greater resources, uh, greater knowledge, uh, greater susceptibility to marketing, uh, whatever, uh, went downtown. Um, do you think that that could be a factor in, in that data as opposed to, uh, uh, to acuity of illness at all? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Anytime we do any sort of claims analysis, there's a million things that we just can't account for. And I think that's a, that's a very obvious one that just, I mean, again, I, keep, I, keep, I, I hate to keep harping back to dialysis, but we know patients as they're going through chronic therapy like that or they're going through intensive therapy like the community setting, they like the, the interaction they have. So I'm not surprised. Um, that they're staying close to home and they, they'd want to kind of, uh, you know, see the same person in an office setting more often. Now, I know that there's been a call for uh, pay, a follow-up question for Eric, a call for um, payment parity uh, between uh, hospitals and, and uh, the outpatient setting. And, and I think Dr. Gold mentioned a, a house bill that uh, would attempt to do that. Um, I know that that uh, payment parity uh, could, a call for that could be balanced by a call for facility parity. Has anybody uh, looked to see what the costs of taking the community and bringing them up to hospital facility standards, uh, what kind of infrastructure costs that would require? No, and I think the, the, the issue a lot of us have as we look at the, the payment parity provisions or the payment parity uh, legislation is just, again, that, that concept of overhead in the hospital. And both CMS, as they've kind of responded to that concept, as well as a number of the hospitals out there, 
just if you think about it from a hospital's perspective, they have uninsured patients that they're probably treating more often in the ER. They need to cover some way or the other. Now, you can debate whether that should be done in higher payments for some of the similar services as the office or whether we should be explicitly financing that in some way or the other. I think that comes down to the question of, of payment parity is how do we deal with some of the things that the hospitals are doing that maybe the offices don't have to. And to that, uh, to regulatory aspects, uh, uh, Rena, what are you are you going to uh, get out your uh, your crystal ball and tell us what in the next month or so Medicare is going to do to change 340B regulations? Um, so, um, as I understand it, it's HRSA that is going to come out with some new regulations, and it's really about defining better the I, who exactly is a patient that may qualify. There are clearly issues about how you actually identify who qualifies, particularly in the contract pharmacy setting. Um, if I had to guess, I think that that's what is going to happen here. Um, I think the other thing that people worry about um, is that um, data systems are not actually that good in trying, in figuring out exactly um, uh, which patient is, L which patient gets the 340B discount and which patient may actually be Medicaid eligible for the rebates as well. And so I think that there's probably going to be a little bit more transparency, um, or at least I would hope there's a little bit more transparency on the information systems that would kind of track that so that there's no duplicate discount. I, I'm not um, sure that um, either passing the um, availability of these discounts through to insurers or through to patients is on their docket at this time. Hey, Rena, can I ask you a question? Is the horse out of the barn? I mean, is the horse out of the barn already? Let's fix 340B, big deal, right? So maybe the price of drugs will go down a little bit, but the shift in side of services already happened to a great extent. I mean, and I think it's mod moderating. That's my opinion, but I don't have data to support that. Yeah, I mean, thank you. So, uh, um, so my view is that I worry about the shift in um, site of service for two reasons. Yes, I worry about 340B, but frankly, the amount of consolidation that we're seeing, both because of 340B, but also for other incentives that are related to the Affordable Care Act, frankly, are going to raise prices. That's because um, it's not just the facility fee or not the facility fee, it's because when we have consolidated providers, they have market power and they're able to, to name their price and frankly, you have to pay it. Um, and so the, the question is, what are, what's the equilibrium? Do we get higher quality um, based on this consolidation? And I really don't know the answer to that question. I think it's gonna be really, that's where it's gonna, where the rubber's gonna hit the road. And, and I'd just add, I guess, from a clinical perspective, that I think as you get this consolidation and maybe more resources going into the system, I, I don't know if there's been survey data on this um, or if it's, I don't, if it's different in the academic setting versus the community setting. It's probably similar. I think the oncologist has less and less time to spend with the patient. So although you're pouring more resources into the system, and I think you can argue there's levels of safety oversight and lots of bells and whistles and maybe, maybe, but maybe not, but better patient support programs. The actual time that an oncologist has to spend with their patient has, has been cut, I think, in recent years. The, um, uh, it, it has seemed to me, and, and of course, you know, as, a, as an oncologist, quite often we're only living our own anecdote. Um, uh, I know that my transition from private practice to a hospital um, was made easier by 340B, but was really required by the circumstances that my practice was in. Uh, when you put up a slide that shows what hospitals get paid or what hospitals charge and you compare it to what is being charged or paid in the, in the office, the natural tendency of the public is going to be to assume that hospitals are getting paid too much. Uh, when my experience is that after MMA, over a period of years, commercial, the commercial side looking for cost improvements went after low-hanging fruit. Low-hanging fruit was not hospitals. Low-hanging fruit was oncologists and private practice docs, and that that very much, as opposed to hospitals having largesse ma making this change, uh, it's really practices uh, because they can no longer sustain the practice that they're in, making a switch to uh, to hospitals. And, and the real issue is, uh, you know, from a payer standpoint, I think you have to ask, you know, are we reaping what we have sown 
if it comes to uh, paying higher prices. I want to expand on that a little bit. I think actually the issue is what Rena had described, and that is that market power existed. So, um, you know, I can't walk into a community where there's only one or two hospital systems and lose those hospital beds. And when they say to me, I'm going to go out and acquire three practices and start charging you a substantial multiple more, I have a choice of saying no or losing hospital bed access. Because they'll say, fine, you can't have the rest of the services, the contract's over, we're done. And it's all about market power, just what Rena said. We've had an interesting anecdote that I, that I think is, makes me hopeful about the power of public opinion. Uh, we had a Northeast institution charge us $1.6 million for a course of your boy. And the ASP on that's about 120000 okay? And we went back to that institution and said, look, you are asking a cancer patient to bear the burden of your underpricing in your neonatology unit, your emergency room, your surgical suites. Price those correctly and distribute the costs where they belong. But don't ask a patient who's suffering from cancer to support the rest of your hospital just because of a quirk in the law. And we got that contract changed on what I'll call the moral argument factor. I didn't expect that. Um, and I, I see that as a hopeful sign. I am hopeful that people will start to realize that exploiting a cancer patient is wrong. And I think somebody charging six, seven, ten times more for the same services is morally wrong. Thank you very much for your participation. Thank you to the panel for your presentations and uh, discussion. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we have time for a break. We're going to start it uh, back up again at 2.58.